today. Um, so a more formal introduction of George is that he has published several books of poetry, as well as the memoir, Shape of the Eye, and several of those books have won awards. And he's also published essays and articles in outlets, um, in addition to the CGS blog, <laughs> uh, the New York Times, Salon, the literary journal, Tin House, and a number of others. And I thought I'd mention that he's part of a band called the Yule on Fire, whose members describe it as semi-acoustic Northwest Stikana. Did I get that right? <laughs> and plus he teaches writing at Oregon State University. Great to have you here, George. <laughs> so Mark Shah has been thinking for a very long time and very, and, and Mark Shah thinks really well <laughs> about about the intersections that actually George names in the subtitle of the book, about disabilities, biotechnologies, and the stories that we tell ourselves, the stories that we tell ourselves about ourselves and about the kinds of um, shared future that, that we want to build. And she has not only thought, but has <laughs> written and edited a lot as well. She's edited uh, several books of stories about people with disabilities. And she's written, I found this on your bio, over 100 articles and essays um, and book chapters on topics that, among others, include disability rights and genetic screening. She served as a member of um, the important uh, working group called the Ethical, Legal, and Social Implications Working Group of the Human Genome Initiative, which she has stories about. <laughs> and also on the boards of the uh, wonderful public interest organizations, Our Bodies, Ourselves, and the Council for Responsible Genetics. She is a teacher, she's a trainer, she's a speaker, she, and her day jobs are as the director of research and training at the World Institute on Disability, and she also is a lecturer in disability studies at UC Berkeley. Okay, this is gonna be a great conversation, and before you start, I just do want to tell you a sentence or two about the sponsoring, co-sponsoring organizations. First is the Paul K. Longmore Institute on Disability at San Francisco State University, which studies and showcases disabled people's experiences in order to revolutionize social views. Through public education, scholarship, and cultural events, a lot of all of those, the institute shares disability history and theory and promotes critical thinking and builds broader community. And I've mentioned that Emily uh, Bakex, the associate director, is here, and Kathy Cudlick, the director, is also here with us. The Health Equity Institute is also a co-sponsor. They are also at San Francisco State University. And the Health Equity Institute's mission is to create an intellectual environment that encourages diversity of perspectives, challenges conventional approaches, and produces innovative action-oriented research in the biomedical, social, and behavioral sciences in order to improve health, eliminate health disparities, and establish health equity in health. Establish equity in health. Good idea. And Laura Mamo, the Associate Director of the Health Equity Institute and Professor of Health Education at San Francisco State University is here with us too. And uh, let's see, the Center for Genetics Society is my organization. We're a nonprofit social justice organization based in Berkeley. And we work to ensure an equitable future in which human genetic and reproductive technologies benefit the common good. Part of what we do is work to ensure that a broad and inclusive range of public and civil society voices are included in deliberations about human biotechnologies. And by that, we want to explicitly include both scholars and advocates who stand for reproductive, disability, racial, LGBTQ, and environmental justice. And Katie Hassan, our uh, program director, and Charles Garzon, our admin director, are here as CGS people, CGSers that you can talk with with any questions. Finally, I want to mention the, uh, and thank the access services at the San Francisco Public Library, also a co-sponsor of this event, and of course, uh, providing us with this wonderful venue and with a whole lot of behind the scenes technical and organizing support. Jane is with us tonight. And um, just to give a plug to the library as being such an important San Francisco institution that we owe a lot of gratitude to. to. So, 
So with that, I'm just going to ask about viewers. Um, a little closer to the microphone. Closer. Okay. Welcome again. Um, so I read your book, I loved it, and I loved it so much that I asked George to send me his previous book, The Shape of the Eye. Um, so I want to describe the cover um, because it's beautiful, and I want to uh, have audio description for our visual here viewers, and, um, audience and readers. And I'm sorry that there aren't more pictures in the books for adults, because the pictures are wonderful. Um, the cover has what looks like the feet of some people standing in line in a watercolor, and it's the shadow that predominates the cover. And I think there's probably a backstory there. Um, I think that the cover of these are very important. Um, and I, I'm curious um, at some point if we can get George to talk about the cover. Um, okay, so George, tell us about the book. And I understand that you want to do some reading. Yeah, I thought I'd just read a short section, but yeah, I, I do want to talk about the book um, uh, a little bit. Can everyone, can you hear all right? Is that good? Okay. Um, so, you know, my line on this book is that the elevator pitch requires a, 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 a very slow elevator in a very tall building. It's it's hard to uh, explain, but, but it basically, um, I see us as being at a, a, a pivotal time in human history, um, and which is to say that, um, and this is most acute in the United States, cultural and um, legal gains for people with disabilities are on the rise. We are not remotely near where we need to be, but, but they, there have been significant gains. Um, I see this uh, uh, partly through the lens of uh, raising a daughter with Down syndrome. The very fact that she can has the legal right to go to school would not have been the case when I was when I was born when I was a child. Um, obviously, still there's a long way to go. At the same time, there are um, our, techno our technological ability to. Um, both quote, read and write DNA allows us the ability to select and shape future people. Often those technologies are rationalized in terms of um, preventing, uh, fixing, or even eliminating disability. I see that I see these two developments, these two cultural developments, as like two two large rivers colliding. And I see us as living all in the cross currents. It's just this swirl of conflicting ideas about disability, about the value, about what, uh, value of life, and which lives we value. Um, the premise of the book is that once we have this power to select and shape future people, either to to pick you know one embryo or not another, or to actually tinker with the DNA of one embryo, that that compels a question of belonging. That raises a question about which bodies and minds we welcome. So that's the premise of the book. Um, the book itself is 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 um, a bit. It's on the model of an essay. It's not a scholarly book, despite all the long words in the subtitle. It is really a kind of a non-specialist wander through this strange territory. My attempt to keep my head above water, where these two streams intersect. My attempt to think through all these conflicting meanings. And it's an invitation to the reader to come along with me. Uh, to do that, I both analyze the stories that we're telling ourselves, I look at the way we're talking about biotech and disability, and at the same time, I tell stories, uh, mainly about my daughter, Laura. So what I thought I'd do is I'd do a short reading uh, from the book just so you can hear what it's like, and then Marsha and I can talk a little bit. So I will do that now. Um, this, uh, both of these readings are two short excerpts from the third chapter. Third chapter is about people and animals. And the premise is that the, um, the idea of directing the evolution of people, of managing the way the species goes, controlling the way the species goes, is always wound up with the idea of um, directing the evolution of animals. And um, I, to talk about this, I reach back into the history of American eugenics. But I start with the story in, in, in the present. This chapter begins uh, with an epigraph 
from a Republican state senator of Oregon uh, from 1917. And the epigraph is this. It says, the people of Oregon have safeguarded the breeding of fancy horses and cattle. They should at least do as much for their people. In the depths of my hard drive is a photograph of Laura, 13, posing next to an alpaca at the Benton County Fair. They are dressed up as Elsa and Anna, the sisters from Frozen. Magno, the alpaca, is draped with pink fabric, and his head sports butterscotch-colored pigtails made from a braided hank of yarn. Laura's hair is sprayed silver, and she is wearing a long blue dress, elbow-length white gloves, and pink New Balance sneakers. As a then member of the Lucky Long Necks 4-H Club, Laura had spent a year working with Magno, who lived on a farm outside town, cropping grass and tending his buried species memory of the Andes. Laura had learned to walk Max forward and backward in a circle. She had brushed his soft coat and learned the names of a couple of alpaca diseases. And one day she even gave him vitamin shots with a veterinary syringe. Laura has since moved on to keeping and showing rabbits. And Max has moved on to the great Peruvian pasture in the sky. But we remember him fondly. He was old and gentle, with an unruly mop of hair and spectacular buck teeth, like a cross between an early beetle and a camel. The Frozen costumes are part of the Large Animal Costume Contest, which is a ritual at the intersection of drag show and animal husbandry. For it, the Lucky Longnecks led their camelids in an impromptu parade around the fairgrounds in the blazing heat. Laura had hoped to sing one of the Frozen numbers for the judges and was disappointed when this turned out not to be an option. Among all of the fears and hopes and uncertainties and predictions I entertained, after Laura arrived and was diagnosed with Down syndrome. I can safely say that no scenario involved an aging male alpaca dressed up to resemble a fictional Disney princess at the Benton County Fair. The costumes were Laura's idea, though Teresa, my wife, had done most of the sewing. We like 4-H for the same reason that we like the Special Olympics Unified Basketball Team. It's a place where children of different abilities can be together on equal, if asymmetrical, terms. But in 2017, as I researched this book, and Laura researched rabbit diseases so that she could answer the judges' questions during showmanship, the history of American eugenics cast a long shadow across the fair. It was sweltering, pushing 109 degrees, and as the sweating kids plumped their rabbits on individual carpet squares waiting for judgment, best in breed, best in show, the whole enterprise seemed like an exercise in bunny eugenics, a separation of the fit from the unfit, a careful examination of bunny physiognomy to determine the local pinnacles of the breed. The directed evolution of people is inseparable from the directed evolution of animals. From Dolly, uh, the cloned sheep, to gene-edited mice, to CRISPR-engineered miniature pet pigs, animals are the models we use to work out the details of the future. But historically, to invoke animals was to invoke intellectual disability. Non-human animals defined the lower boundary of a human heart hierarchy, which feeble-minded people approached or crossed. It was a racialized hierarchy, with whiteness at the top and non-white races at the bottom. That complex set of prejudices is dis distilled in the phrase Mongolian idiocy, which blends race and disability and it underlies John Langdon Down's racial system. But that loose association of race, disability, and non-human animals is still endemic online. So for all these reasons, Laura's presence at the 2017 Benton County Fair, a full member of the Claws and Paws of the Round Table 4-H Club, which is not to be confused with the Benton Rabbiteers, the Critters of the Valley, or the Happy Hoppers, a high school junior with a Facebook account and a bedroom wall banded with blue ribbons and Star Wars stickers at the high tide line of her outstretched fingers is a marker of genuine progress. In the early decades of the 20th century, at the height of American eugenics, a child classified as feeble-minded would have been present, if at all, as an idea of what to avoid. For a time, in fact, it was people as well as animals competing for ribbons at the fair. And so what, what I talk about next is there is this very odd cultural phenomenon during the kind of the golden, I don't know if you can call it golden age of American eugenics, the leaden age of American eugenics, the, the, the mainline eugenic era, um, called the Better Babies Contest and the Bitter Families Contest. And these were contests that were held at, at state fairs where families would undergo extensive 
um, examinations, answer questionnaires, be asked about genealogies, and to be given a grade about who is fit to breed. And at the end, the, the, the most fit family would win, um, would win a ribbon and a trophy. And you can still see pictures of these um, contests. They also had the Better Babies contest where they dressed all the babies up in togas for some reasons and, and, and they graded them as well. Um, and this, you know, this is interesting to me as a writer because um, central to the whole eugenics project was this stock breeding metaphor, this idea that you know, breeding animals and breeding humans is parallel. So this ritual made that literal. And I just want to read a couple of the posters that um, accompanied these uh, contests. So one reads, how long are we Americans to be so careful for the pedigree of our pigs and chickens and cattle and then leave the ancestry of our children to chance or to blind sentiment? And as I write, the block letters are handwritten. Um, despite the implied ethos of perfection, the lines are not quite parallel. The significance of the quotation marks around the word blind is unclear, but the parallels with contemporary rhetoric are unmistakable. If human improvement is on stage, disability-based metaphors are usually skulking in the wings. And I want to, I'll just read a short bit from the end of the chapter. Um, another thing that I write about in this um, um, chapter is de-extinction. That's the project, the idea of bringing back um, uh, creatures like the passenger pigeon and mammoth, and I, I was really, I'm really interested in that application of, um, of genetic technology and how it might relate to um, other kinds. So, fitter families, better babies, de-extinction, metaphor, Laura, bunnies, mammoths, Oregon, home. Um, I'm building a Rube Goldberg device. I'm writing the way a synthetic biologist might, if the synthetic biologist were a nonlinear thinker with a daughter with Down syndrome. Perhaps this is only serious play, making with a question attached, a non-standard thing built from the registry of standard intellectual parts, a chimera made of words. If this is the case, so be it. I pursue the connections to see if there are any, and I try to assemble disparate things into a working picture, to find coherence, a stay against confusion. So as I think about the possibility of mammoths becoming more common, I think about Down syndrome becoming more rare. Live births of children with Down syndrome are currently about a third less than what would be expected, and with the increased uptake of new prenatal tests, this trend is likely to accelerate. I don't think people with Down syndrome will go extinct, but they may become vanishingly uncommon. Uh, one online graphic used, uh, at, and this is at the uh, organization Revive and Restore that's used to advance uh, the project of de-extinction. One graphic shows extinct and threatened creatures as shadows in a landscape. I, mention, I imagine a parallel image showing silhouettes of people with genetic conditions, Down syndrome, hereditary deafness, a chondroplasia, my daughter, the gore, the Bicardo. For many, I think, more mammoths and less Down syndrome is a win-win a desirable outcome. The pitches, in any event, are linked. The same people who argue for resurrecting lost species tend to argue for eliminating genetic disease. Whether Down syndrome goes the way of the dodo depends then on whether it is considered a disease, whether it is seen as part of a diverse humanity, or simply as a problem we'd be better off without. That no official eugenics records office or American Eugenics Society is vested in reducing the numbers of people with Down syndrome, that no coercive government agency sets current reduction targets, is not as important as it seems. New prenatal tests are sold to individuals and sold with a rhetoric of individual choice, but cultural values influence individual decisions, which are in turn multiplied by technologies into population effects. So perhaps one day, American fitter families will leave their future firesides, traveling on the Siberian Adventure Tourist Package to see hairy elephants tromping the permafrost. Maybe passenger pigeons will darken the skies above the subdivisions where the New England forests were, raining feces on the tracked homes of genetically healthy families. Maybe 4-H will add new categories to its small animal competition, best de-extincted, best engineered. There will be Facebook posts, Mackenzie's passenger pigeon won best of breed, hashtag DIY bio, hashtag de-extinction, hashtag so proud. There will be super muscular cavies, meat rabbits the size of Labrador retrievers, roosters with perfect dun-colored dry fly capes so long you could tell, tie ten pale morning duns with a single feather. If these come to pass, I'm less concerned about the animals, animals being shown 
than the children doing the showing about who will be present and welcome. What, among many things I love about this book when I read it, and I was so pleased with it that I quickly asked George to send me the previous book, and I read that one. Um, both are very intimate, um, personal essays. The Shape of the Eye, much more memoir. Um, so uh, I'm very moved by your writing. Um, and also that there is so much in common with our interests in my work over my decades, and I've been involved in the disability rights movement for four decades now. Um, my interests stemmed from my birth um, with spina bifida, and again, in issues in common, Down um, syndrome is the primary target of prenatal screening and selective abortion, and my disability is the second most prevalent. Um, so that's compelling for me. Um, uh, I, George mentioned the, the eugenics movement, which is such a big deal for us to explore and understand. Um, by the way, you said the book is not scholarly, but I think it is. It's a very nuanced analysis from a disability studies scholarly perspective. I will do everything I can get do to get this book into disability studies. Right into it. Okay. Um, so I encountered eugenic ideology in my childhood. Um, many medical providers subtly or unsubtly made sure that I should not plan to procreate. And my mom had to fight to get me into kindergarten. Um, I being a child with typical cognitive function. Um, so things, yes, have changed. We've gone, we moved light years ahead in my lifetime and we have like years to go around the world as well as in the United States. So um, I really appreciate George's. Um, so we're going to be getting into um, the issues of genetic technologies in our conversation. Um, I do want to mention some basic concepts for our listening audience. Um, one is about what George develops very nicely is a distinction between what we call the medical and the social models of disability. And biotechnologies focus on changing genes to improve people is very much a medical model approach. The assumption is what's wrong with people with disabilities is solely located in that individual's body and from the purview of genetic science in that person's genetic makeup, their DNA. The social model looks very broadly at the society and locates disability in the environment, in the attitudes, in the architecture. Sometimes disability discrimination is literally built into the cement, into the bricks, the stairs, the lack of elevators. Or now with amazing new technologies, people with disabilities can be included in all kinds of ways, cool ways that weren't available in previous decades or centuries. Um, so. We challenge the medical model. I like to call it the medical deficit model because we don't want to blame doctors. It wasn't their fault. These, these notions are millennia old. Um, and as a result of the confusion set by the medical model, the stereotypes of people with disabilities abound. And a piece of the stereotype is don't ask, don't stare. Don't learn, don't connect. So I want to ask George to talk about the stereotypes of people with Downs, his daughter, and people of all ages. Well, so thank you for that, Marcia. And that it means a lot to me. I mean, I am a very I I don't identify as disabled. I haven't faced these things um, in life. I'm connected to questions of disability through and because of my daughter, Laura. So uh, that, that raises a whole separate host of questions for a writer. What does it mean for me to weigh in on these subjects at all? And it, it does mean taking a lot of care and trying to defer to other voices when, when I can. Um, but that's, that's, that's by the way, by, on, in terms of stereotypes, um, you know, I, I, I covered a lot of this in the previous book, The Shape of the Eye. And I kind of saw that book 
as driven by a tension between two figures. Okay, one is the stereotype of Down syndrome, which is, you know, like, I mean, you, I don't even need to explain it to you. I mean, I knew it before Laura was born, and I think, you know, there, there's that, that they are sweet, um, that they are good-natured, you know, sometimes stubborn, musical, and I, I did a lot of thinking about those, but in the end, I was trying to oppose that kind of ghostly stereotype to the real live individual who is my daughter, who is not a generalization of a diagnosis, but who is a single person living at a certain time in the Pacific Northwest in a certain circumstance. And to kind of contrast the shadow of stereotype versus, versus the full body person. Um, similarly, for a writer, that means um, thinking about a person having an individual singular story as opposed to stereotypes which are abstracted from time. So, um, uh, you know, obviously every, um, I think, you know, form of embodiment, every, every form of disability is likely to have some stereotypes attached to it. And the problem is, is that they, they one, one of the many problems is that they obliterate the perceived identity of the person. Um, I think that it's, um, that, that Alison uh, Carey wrote uh, on the margins of citizenship, right? She's saying it's, you know, we have made great strides. There are rights that are written into law that didn't exist before. But it's not enough to have those rights there. The person has to be perceived as a bearer of rights. And so if that person is perceived only as a medical figure or only as being kind of, you know, cute or sweet or whatever, um, then, then it, it almost doesn't matter. Um, you, you actually moved me to think a little differently about all different kinds of categories of impairment. Um, actually, that's another piece of disability theory I'd like to share that we call the actual physiologic condition that a person has the, the impairment because we want to make a distinction between that and the, the limitation and ability of people with these impairments um, caused by this society and those we, that we refer to as the disability because people with disabilities have all kinds of abilities. And so, um, I think we could do the same history that, and, and analysis that George gives to Downs with every category of disability. It started making me think about, for example, deaf people have written quite a bit, blind people have written quite a bit about the socialization of the society in relation to those two categories. Um, but I have yet to see a book about dwarfism, for example, with such a wrenching history of the seven dwarfs and, um, you know, court jesters and so on. That, and so I maybe start thinking about spina bifida. What are the myths of spina bifida that I could explore and write about? And, you know, I'm going to get together a focus group of people with my condition. Um, jumping ahead toward the end of the book, you develop um, some thinking about Roy Rogers and Dale Evans. How many old people like me here remember that? Um, and I didn't, I hadn't thought about this since I was maybe seven years old. So in my bedroom I shared with my brother, there was a, a, a light, a night light with Roy Rogers and Dale Evans. And um, my mom, who was a really great advocate for me, my, my parents were sort of like you and Teresa. Um, my parents refused to accept uh, the stereotypes about disability. And I'm also very moved by my friends who didn't have that kind of parents who have turned into ferocious fighters for disability rights. But my mom made a point to tell me that Dale Evans and Roy had a child with, that, with a disability. I don't know, if she, I don't remember. And I, I remember, now, no, I don't remember. And now I'm thinking back that my mom wanted to connect with other parents with disabilities. And at the time in my upbringing in the 50s, there was no support groups for parents. There was no social workers for parents. There was the doctor, and giving you know the best information they could, as well as a lot of misinformation about my condition and the conditions of other children that I was meeting in Shriners Hospital. Um, so I want to talk some about parents um, and the marketing to parents about these genetic technologies 
and the impact on a pretty vulnerable population of people who may have pregnancy and are thinking about parenthood maybe for the first time or whatever, and how the marketing um, can influence the way these technologies are used and sold. So, um, so yeah, thank you, Marcia. And then uh, we and we we talked about this some before this event. Just a, uh, the general idea about it's an impairment in context. It's the body in context that determines the experience, de determines the meaning of disability, and that you were fortunate enough to have parents who advocated for you, which changed the meaning of of the impairment. Um, uh, this is. This was, you know, new to me in um, 2001 when Laura was born and I was trying to sort through all this stuff and just beginning to realize that, um, one, how many misconceptions I already held about, like, this is bad news or a tragedy or anything else, and two, realizing that the future is actually up to us, to Laura, and dependent on other things, too. So that context is, is critical. Um, with respect to genetic technology, so I write in the book some about a new um, kind of um, prenatal test called NIPT or NIPS, non-invasive prenatal screening, and it is a um, it's a blood test for pregnant women. It, it um, is able to detect the chances of Down syndrome and some other disorders based purely on a maternal blood sample, as opposed to, say, uh, amniocentesis, which, um, which samples amniotic fluid. Um, it is not a diagnostic test. It's a, it's a screening test, which means it tells you chances, but nothing absolutely certain. Um, what interests me about the um, prenatal testing is the, um, the fact that these tests are for-profit products, and so they're accompanied by for-profit persuasion. I'm interested in the ads. And there's a really important distinction to make, which is to say that, you know, genetic counselors I've talked to say that these are, are reasonably good screening tests. They have their limitations like any test. Many women find them useful. One can understand that that is the case and that this can be part of a, a woman's pregnancy decision-making in cooperation with a genetic counselor can be reasonably useful in that way, and at the same time say that the ads themselves are deeply problematic, in the same way that one can say that depression is a real thing, and antidepressants can help with that, and yet that some advertising, advertisements and marketing practices are deeply disturbing. So I focused on the ads, and what I found was that they were, in, in a way, really conservative, not, not as in Democrat-Republican uh, conservative, but in the sense that they um, showed ideal people in a very, very narrow band. Um, they showed mothers who were lean towards white. There was some diversity there, but they were more white. They were very well off. Their children were uh, chromosomally typical and beautiful. The families pictured were clearly uh, two parent families in a heterosexual union where typically the husband was a male model and he was protective and loving and the, the woman was attractive and she clearly never had any nausea or, or excessive weight gain or anything else. And so it was this kind of ideal world of the same kind that is used to sell us everything from Diet Coke to, um, you know, potato chips. And that struck me as itself problematic because this is an incredibly consequential decision and it seemed to me like this information would be better coming um, from a medical professional and not from an online ad. So um, I guess to me this question matters uh, for two reasons. One is that because these decisions are so consequential and because they're so fraught, uh, because the desire for, uh, the reasonable desire for a healthy child is so strong, this is a very delicate situation, and I think words and images can have a greater effect. So that's one reason that this interests me. The second is that future genetic products are also likely to be for profit. And so if we look at the way current products are marketed now, we maybe have a clue as to how to think about the future products that come down. If, for example, 
um, something, uh, as is advocated by some, say uh, CRISPR-Cas9, which is sometimes called a word processor for genomes, is used to alter uh, embryos. These are likely to be products as well. And so we should think about how will they be pitched to us? I think as citizens, we should think, how will we respond? How can we be appropriately skeptical and evaluate these things in a way that, that contributes to our happiness, our flourishing? <laughs> okay, we're thinking about eugenics. We're thinking about CRISPR, which is C R I S P R. It's an acronym for a very long, complicated genetic description of the process. Um, and these forces are operating. Um, Eugenics operates in an unconscious way in our society. Um, we like to think that that era is over. It is so not. There are still women being sterilized, primarily now black women in prison. But even up until the 70s, um, um, sterilization of women um, assumed to be problematic in terms of whom they might produce was still um, operating. So eugenic I ideology operates in the realm of the Procreation, but at the more DNA level, um, the conversation um, operates without the voices of people, largely without the voices of people who actually know what it's like to live the experience of these conditions. Um, and there's a paragraph that I okay. I was promised easy questions, but. <laughs> um, for you. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I was talking about this with Marcy earlier. I mean, in in one way, it's the easiest thing to agree on, right? Like, um, we have powerful technologies, and it's it's no longer notional. We can engineer the species quite easily if we want to. Uh, we can do it at scale. CRISPR is cheap, it's easy to use. It's not remotely ready for the clinic, um, but it, it could be soon. Um, it has error rates. It, it, you send it in and it makes some changes and it can also make some changes you didn't want to have happen. Um, my basic assumption is that um, given the presence of these technologies, they're more likely to contribute to human flourishing across the board if more of us weigh in. And one reason it is hard to get that conversation going is that um, there are so many other things to occupy our attention. Like, even if you forget the games on our phones and Netflix, there is the small matter of climate change and the fact that the government appears to be crumbling. So with all of that stuff, it's really hard to think about a slightly more distant thing, like, well, what if we're engineering the species? Um, one reason I wrote this book the way I did, to do it as a kind of informal, like, say, I'm a non-specialist, I'm actually a poet, I'm going to ramble through these things, is to hopefully give people a little bit of courage to say, well, OK, I can ramble through this too. I can learn a little bit more about it. I can raise my voice, even if I'm not a molecular biologist. I can learn to speak. Um, But beyond the question of more of us needing to become aware and participate, there's a more acute question of what our position is in the conversation. There's a way in which conversation can simply ratify what people are going to do anyway, where it can be like, okay, well, you've, you've, you know, you've spoken up and your, your position is noted, but we're, we're going to leave it with the experts now. And I think that, so ultimately it becomes a, a question, the way I put it in the book is the difference between having a voice and having a say. And um, I, I think that's a really important distinction. Um, so people like Marsha, who have been raising hell for four decades, are going to be really important in this kind of conversation, speaking up and saying, OK, well, the rhetoric attached to this technology basically dehumanizes me. It, it renders me as a problem as opposed to part of a spectrum of human variation or a, someone who is, uh, has a creative way of being in the world or anything like that. 
So I think the conversation needs to be more widespread. I think it needs to include the people who are um, most likely to be affected by the technologies. And I, my dream is that it will not simply be a matter of consultation, but a, a matter of actual democratic participation. And I don't know how to make that happen, but that's my Christmas wish list. Okay, good. Great. Um, the lines, if, if we're using that metaphor, are really fuzzy. Um, for those of us in the disability community, we're, we're not advocating that there be more disabled people in the world. Although, I personally am a staunch supporter of the value of the lives of people with disabilities. There's lots of goofy stereotypes about how courageous and inspiration, inspirational we are, which are not that helpful. Um, but I think that people with disabilities have really unique lives and interesting contributions. Um, and our perspectives are valuable. Um, my primary concern that involves disability stereotyping is the notion that the burden of our lives and our suffering can be stopped with these technologies. These assertions made without actually involving the communities of people with these conditions. And we get, again, the return to the medical social model that, from my standpoint, having met literally thousands of people with disabilities and gotten close to very many, um, that a lot for the vast majority of people with disabilities, the suffering is caused by oppression. That the exclusion, the lack of accommodations, the attitudes, just stuff about who we are not appreciating and accepting that our unique experiences and the ways of moving and the way we look, um, everything about us is a lot of fun and a lot of creativity and of great value. So I want to talk about how <clears throat> these specific stereotypes can be challenged and I want to engage the audience and I think we're going to move toward questions and comments from you because we want your ideas. We want you to read the book, and George is selling some, by the way, um, $25. Um, and we want your thinking, and we want your ideas about how to engage the public, the disability community, your family, your church or temple group, your everybody, your organizations, in conversations that will move these, this thinking forward. So let's turn to the audience. Yeah. Um, this is a, a, a suggestion about how we can you know, do better or whatever. But I'm really curious if anybody in these technology, biotechnology conversations and, and genetic testing and all that are thinking systematic or systemically about things. So for example, if you edit one set of genes, what are the ramifications in a generation or two generations and how are they connected to other, other genes down the road? Are, are people thinking about that or is it purely sort of just my baby, it's going to happen like this for my kid, and, and down the road it doesn't matter. And I'm wondering if that's a way, I know we're not a great society about thinking, you know, three steps ahead ourselves, but um, I'm wondering if anybody is um, engaging in that kind of study and thinking about it. I can answer as a lay person, and then maybe there are some science-minded people who are, know more about that, but I think primarily it is, con is framed within a consumer perspective that the, the technologies are being thought of as a way to fix this next um, pregnancy rather than thinking down the road at all because we don't have that understanding of DNA, of human DNA or anybody's, any animal's DNA. So somebody else want to comment? So I think there, um, I, I think there's, it depends on where you look. I mean, obviously, I think as a research question, people are, are thinking about, like, you know, have this understanding that a change you make in one generation may, may have unpredictable effects in further generations. Um, I would, you know, for this book, I was looking less at the, the basic research than at the, at the consumer decision. And in, in that framework, it's purely, a, a, you know, about a parent and, and child. Um, there are many, um, there are many parents who um, have uh, children with an inherited disease who are interested in using gene editing 
as a way to potentially uh, prevent that disease, especially if it's a, yeah, is it, in other words, and I think for some parents who would rather not um, have an abortion, the, the possibility of changing the one letter that is resulting in something is very appealing. And I want to, I feel like I need to read more of that and, and understand, um, you know, understand that. So, um, but I can't, I can't feel, I feel like I can't generalize like across the board whether that's the case, but certainly in the consumer perspective, it's not about later generations at all. Uh, there are many of us in bioethics concerned about um, the politics right now. There's debating about whether we should have a moratorium or even a ban on this technology. Um, you know, given the history of eugenics and the assumption that in the heyday of a eugenic ideology, um, there was such arrogance that that those people knew. I mean, the, the, the appalling research methodology that was operating then has been exposed. But now we're at a point in history where we see the assumption all the time that we figured that out. Now we can operate with an ethical attitude, and we have nothing to worry about. And that is such faulty thinking. We don't know what the impact of messing with the genes can be down the road. So uh, you know, many of us feel very strongly that we should ban this technology because we have so little knowledge of the impact of this editing. So I want to hear from other people. So I think I agree with, or I mostly agree with the disability community concerning these technologies. But then I was reading, I think it was E.I. Care who brought up the idea of polio and vaccinations. And once I was wondering, I have, I have a difficult time reconciling vaccination in the context of these questions. And I was wondering how you reconcile with that. Oh, about the polio vaccine? Yeah, or just, I guess vaccinations in general, like, like most of us think, oh yeah, of course you take all these vaccinations, and what's the difference between vaccinations and gene editing? I would say there's a huge difference between vaccinations and gene editing. Um, and I, I'm not going to get into the vaccination debate right now because we don't really have time. Um, we can talk afterwards. In fact, we can stick around a little bit. Um, but I think that vaccinations, the, the concept of vaccinations are a public health issue. And there is a controversy because there are children with immune struggles who have negative reactions to vaccines, and that's problematic. Um, but the idea of the polio vaccine being disability discriminatory, I think, is, is a good um, So I think that's a clear bright line to be drawn, personally. Anybody else want to? So, um, so there, there's a couple of differences. One, um, one is that CRISPR, uh, CRISPR-Cas9 applied to embryos is experimental vaccinations are not. Their um, vaccination is treating a, a single existing child. Um, altering an embryo is creating something different. So there are two really significant differences there. Um, I, I'm glad you brought that up because this is one, one way in which new technologies are uh, advanced is by likening them to the familiar, something that's already accepted. So it does seem as if the, um, this technique could be understood as a public health measure, as genetic vaccination. But at this point, um, there is a huge difference between something that is proven, um, like the ability of the polio vaccine to, um, to prevent polio. You can point to the eradication of smallpox. You can point to the... Uh, well, unfortunately, the resurgence of measles, but the effectiveness of vaccine against measles. So these are um, incredibly 
low to no risk interventions as a co opposed to something experimental and new. So I think the details are really, really important there. Thank you. Thank you. A, a comment and a question. Um, I think in regards to your question, original question, I think that inclusion is so key to um, people um, understanding what disability is, understanding the value. Um, and um, one of the most moving um, parts of your book came very early, um, where you were talking about your house, and you were talking about the door to your house, and how on the outside of your house is the world, and how Laura in the world is stigmatized in all these ways. And inside your house, it's completely different. Um, she is valued, differences are embraced, and all these wonderful things. Um, and, and that resonated a lot with me. And um, my question for you is, um, and I'm afraid it's not going to be an easy question. <laughs> um, my question for you is, um, how has your experience raising Laura, um, has it, and if so, how has it changed both how you think about intelligence, which after all is something that I think any of us in the room will say that um, the things that we love the most we might think of as the product of a sharp or heightened or thoughtful intelligence. Um, how, does it, how has your experience raising her changed how you think about intelligence or how you value intelligence, which is also a category that we associate with our humanity in a lot of sense? I've written about this in both books. So a couple of things. One, one is um, just, um, I had always said that I didn't believe intellect was everything. And to some extent, this was you know being a smart-ass 15-year-old rebe rebelling against parents who very much wanted him to go to Harvard. And I was like, you know, whatever. Um, I'm going to do something different. And, <laughs> But but you know I was like you know you know intelligence isn't everything empathy matters all these things matter. so that's what I claimed and it's what I thought I believed but having Laura called me on that so to have a, a child with an intellectual disability made me realize that um, it's one thing to assert that intellectually and another thing to live it so Laura's um, it wasn't. It's partly uh, Laura's arrival and thinking about her, reacting to her, changed me in many, many ways. But one was to really um, uh, bring home what it meant to believe what I said I believed. Now, with respect to this book, I want to go back to, to something Marcia said, uh, which is about the, the claim that, like the old uh, eugenics, the main what's called the mainline era of eugenics, classical American eugenics, about 1900 to 1935. It's often said it's like that's completely different from now. But the historians that I really value have charted many continuities. The double desire for health and human improvement is one that Nathaniel Comfort writes about very convincingly. But the other strong connection between the old version of eugenics and whatever is happening now is the overvaluing of intellect, the enshrinement of intellect as the, the main, um, as the main um, uh, feature of interest. You know, you have this in the dreams of, you know, maybe engineering or selecting for super, you know, ever smarter people. Um, I find that problematic, and um, so uh, Laura's arrival really had me thinking differently about intellect and IQ and all the rest, and so in this book I tried to push that meditation out yet further. Thank you. You raise this really important distinction between getting a voice and having a say. And I was wondering if more and more people were able to have a voice, especially people from the disability rights communities, what would you urge them to say? And I was wondering, and, <clears throat> and I hope to read the book and then I'll know, um, in that discussion of what you would urge them to say, do you in your book make a distinction, the, the distinction that gets made between somatic editing and germline editing, and there, 
is there, a le is there information there for people in the disability rights community to know um, so that um, somatic editing might affect them without problems, but germline editing could be a problem, and would you urge that to stop? Uh, thank you. That's, and I'm glad you brought that distinction up because I wanted to, to uh, mention that one uh, after what, what uh, Marcia's talking about gene editing. We're, so there's a, a critical distinction between germline editing, which is editing either sperm, egg, or embryo, which means those changes will be passed down in perpetuity, and somatic editing, which affects one person. Like, for example, if you um, you know, uh, editing someone's um, stem cells and restoring them to that person so they can generate healthy cells. But that, the somatics editing, I don't have a problem with in principle. Um, and in fact, some of the people doing that work, one reason they hesitate about germline editing is the fear that a, a, a high profile disaster in inheritable editing can screw up all the other useful uh, clinical applications. I should say, too, just speaking generally, I don't have a problem with CRISPR per se. It's a tool. It's a useful tool. My wife actually uses it in her lab. So the problem is, is, not, is not CRISPR to me, nor is it somatic editing. I'm really pretty closely focused on germline editing as something that, is, that would be a, a great concern. Um, I am really hesitant, kind of for the reasons I mentioned before, to urge people with disabilities to say anything. I want to hear what they have to say, including the difficulties, too, to say, it's like, well, what are, you know, what are the aspects of this impairment? What are the gray areas, say, involving chronic pain is often cited, you know? Um, what are the things that are less affected by stigma? What might want you want to change? I, I would want to hear all of it and then take it in. But this is, I don't have, um, a something to urge. I more want to. I just think that there's a huge dearth of voices of people living with, uh, creatively with disabilities, and, and as often pointed out, is our um, resource of how to live with technologies. And we're talking about technologies. The people who are living in the closest interface with technology are people with disabilities, and yet their voices are. are there. Yeah. Just a follow-up. Yeah. Hi. Um, uh, that's very interesting. So how would you uh, suggest we avoid the problem that I think you also referenced, which is, although I, I hope I'm not putting words in your mouth, that the more we discuss, the more we normalize something, that perhaps instead of saying, this is not a good idea, we shouldn't be doing it, the, the more people that we bring to the table, the more we normalize the idea that this is something that actually has, I mean, you know, like, what's wrong with your life? You know what I'm saying? I think it depends on how we talk about it. I think it, it depends. I think that, um, uh, I mean, that's a really, that's a really good question. I, I actually think of this is a little bit of a tangent, but I think about this in terms of the movies, which is to say there, there are superhero movies all have enhanced people, right? <laughs> genetically, technologically enhanced people. And some of them have a really strong message of warning. Like I wrote about Spider-Man, the 2012 Spider-Man in here, which is a, a very, has a fairly strong anti-corporate um, message, a very strong uh, message about the abuses of technologies and the way the, the wish for cure can slide into the wish to become a giant lizard guy. I don't know. But, um, but, but you know, um, even so, even as the movie is clearly giving this skeptical message, it's making it all look really cool. <laughs> it's normalizing it. So even a warning can normalize. So I don't have an easy answer for that, but I think one thing that is useful to do is to ask Emperor's News Clothes questions. It's like, okay, so what error rate is acceptable? Like, let's say we start, you know, if, even let's, let's say that we're not talking about enhancements, you know, not talking about ultraviolet vision things, any of that, the transhuman stuff. Let's say that, like, we're going to focus on things that everyone agrees are, are diseases, right? What error rate is acceptable? Who's responsible? You know, who gets to say? 
Who's going to govern these things? Because it's easy to talk about this stuff in the abstract, but this thing is going to come down to actual people visiting actual clinics. How expensive is it going to be? If this involves large-scale harvesting of eggs, who's going to be donating the eggs? And so now you're into, and then uh, to some extent, you're displacing the question just from the technology, which is the shiny, cool stuff, into the old questions that I hope would interest us anyway, which are questions of equity and fairness. So that's, you know, uh, off, off the cuff as best I can do. <laughs> We do mean not to romanticize disability. It can be, disability can be somewhere between very inconvenient and devastating, including early death and tremendous pain. Um, but I absolutely agree that the, the voices that we want to hear will change the dialogue. Um, and you're right, we can't speak for anybody else, so I'm speaking for myself. Um, you know, that as I m mentioned, the, 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 the main concern that I have is that stereotypes of the burden and suffering of people with disabilities is being exploited by the marketing of these technologies. But, and there are other constituencies at stake here. Racism is a huge factor in the applications of, uh, potentially the applications of these ge genetic technologies and gender identity and so on. And so we need to hear from all marginalized constituencies in this conversation to have a better picture. And I'm intrigued with this notion of normalization. Um, but I'm not so worried about that yet as much as getting the marginalized communities engaged. And outside of our denial and despair, I, I have a concept of, of eugenic denial, sort of um, analogous to climate denial. You know, if you think somebody else is handling it, you are in denial because no. So I, I want us, we really need to wake up here and engage in our, in our community groups conversations about these technologies. And I think Ian is fighting that. Uh, yeah, I wanted to jump back briefly to, um, you mentioned the possibility of a, a banner moratorium on these technologies. And I wonder if that's something we've had to cover with the deaf community over the last 15 years. Uh, with respect to cochlear implants, with that, that there, there is no putting the gene back to model, right? It's, it, it's here. And so we've had to sort of reframe how we think about our community and who belongs in that community and what it means to, to have a cochlear implant and also be a deaf person and, and all of these things. And so I'm wondering if that is, if we're at a similar stage with respect to CRISPR, where in particular, given that it's, it's well published enough that it doesn't have to be limited to U.S. research labs, that uh, we're past the point of the banner and moratorium, and uh, have to start grappling with this is out there. What do we do next? How do we, how do we start to do this? I would say I think that's a, a really I think it's a really good point. But I would say a, a key difference is that cochlear implants are widely used, and there's a whole network of you know, teaching of like, um, my friend Laura Malden wrote a great book called Made to Hear about that. And so that there, you know, there are uh, therapists who teach or inculcate parents in their use when uh, children are, are born deaf and, and there's, so there are many people using them now. CRISPR, so far as we know, has been used to edit embryos twice. In the case of Chinese twins who were born, someone and then the same uh, scientist, Fijian Kui, seems to have uh, initiated a second pregnancy with this. But um, a moratorium is reasonable, I think, because the technology is out of the bottle, but the clinical practice is not at this point. Now, whether a moratorium would be effective, whether one should have a moratorium or a ban are different questions, but but I would I would say at least in terms of uptake, there's a pretty significant difference between the two. I might be giving a very different answer in like ten years, though I hope not. Does that make sense? Tina, has got her hand up again. I know, but I'm not here. Yeah. <laughs> so a couple of things. First of all, thank you both. Uh, Appreciate your work. Uh, work. So I was thinking back on two, two things that have come up. One is the, the question of how we move the conversation. And, and I think that actually education provides us with lots of opportunities. 
or had that conversation, but I don't think in many cases teachers feel equipped. Um, you might have seen the article that was just floating around a couple of weeks ago about climate change, which uh, the vast majority of parents from across you know political spectrum would like their children to be engaged around issues of climate change. And then when you get to the teachers, uh, there's a variety of reasons why they don't teach it. Most of them feel ill-equipped, but also don't have the resources to teach it. So I do think that there actually is a space to sort of move those conversations into the classroom. You would have to think creatively about creating some curriculum and scaffolding it. But my hunch is that the students want to be in the conversations anyways, and in many cases, it's the adults that are doing better. And so I think that we could think creatively about how to, um, bless you, uh, create a series of sort of scaffolded resources we could engage in conversations and I think move them down uh, to younger folks so that they're in the conversation early so that it's not something that they are scared to go into later. We normalize the conversation about wrestling and grappling with these issues. So for me, I think that, that uh, is a huge opportunity. Yeah. Uh, the other one I'm thinking about is, is that also the need to destabilize this sort of idea that we're over and done with eugenics because I would agree with you know, with both of you, that there are a tremendous number of continuities. And I'm thinking about some very, what would it look like to do some very particular studies when we look at the relationships between the institutions that historically promulgated uh, eugenic notions and thought and actually are consistently engaged with technologies that seem to be reproducing uh, the same sense of uh, devaluation and rooted in the same sense of assumptions. Uh, because I, you know, the more I look, there is no bright line and there is no consistent pattern of sustained contestation. And so the intellectual inertia behind these ideas, I would argue, is still moving full speed ahead. And with the market drivers, it may even pick up steam. So I'm wondering about the idea of intervening with a series of particular um, historical case studies that might help to draw out these kind of movies. Um, I'm, I'm just going to agree wholeheartedly. I have the privilege of teaching um, university students, and I have a lot of hope in young people. Um, so I don't want to succumb to the despair that we can't change the conversation and change policy um, with either climate justice, environmental justice, or um, with the applications of CRISPR and, and the human genome. Um, so um, I, I, I'm hanging on to hope. Uh, um, other, Dina, did you want to? I was going to encourage that you oh. wrap up just to make sure to have yeah, we, to sell we, those we're going to get kicked out at 730 because the library closes. So we're going to make some closing comments. Yeah, everything Marcia said. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. Um, no, um, uh, I guess the one thing I would add to, to uh, what we've been saying um, is a short pitch for the value of literature, which is to say that, that if um, disabilities and diseases are not simply abstractions or diagnoses, but are, are experienced by people in particular places and times. Um, it's to literary techniques that we need to turn to, to see that. We need the, the best writing to, to help us grasp what these conditions mean in context. At the same time, it's literary techniques that are being used, metaphor, story, and the rest, to sell new technology. So we need to learn to read more critically so that we can understand when, when that spell is being cast in a maybe not so helpful way. Um, I, I want to close with, with sharing my pride in social justice movements and the Disability Rights International Wide World Movement in particular. Um, I've been involved for 40 years in this movement. Um, and I just did a focus group and interviewed young people about transportation issues for disabled people getting around and being able to go. And the expectations over my lifetime have changed so profoundly. People with disabilities expect to be able to go where everybody else goes. Like, what? Yeah. And I particularly was moved by a high school student um, that I met at a conference on, on Saturday who knew her rights under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, we have come so far in such a short time. Just, you know, within my lifetime, um, from the charity model 
was hospitalized in Shriners, which was a charity hospital, and they did it as they could in that era, the 50s and 60s, to a very powerful social understanding of the nature of disability depression. And I'm expecting in my lifetime, and I expect to live, you know, a few more decades at least, um, that the worldwide movement for disability rights and, and full inclusion is and can expect to be, continue to be one of the most, most powerful movements in the history of the world. I believe that. Join us. Read this book. <laughs> Thank you all for coming.